said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with the outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you out to the land I swore with uplifted hand, and to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give you it to you as a, a possession. I am the Lord. Thank you, Elijah. It's great to see everybody today. What a good thing to be able to worship God today and be pleasing to him. It's always good things going on around here. And uh, I'm excited about the holiday coming up. I'm excited about new babies. That's always a good thing. Anytime you got new babies around, well, that's always great. Makes you be able to remember back and say, Whew, glad I'm not there again. <laughs> In just a couple of weeks, we have John Smith coming to be able to talk about this idea of marriage and divorce and remarriage and what that's really all about. We have not been very effective in dealing with that in our world today. This ought to be a ministry. This ought to be a place where we could go and help broken people to be able to find God. And usually what we find is we end up, none of them are here. And so we want to fix that somewhat and see what we can do. So John is coming on the 14th of July. And so Friday night's going to be the purpose of marriage. He's going to have two sessions dealing with that. And then Saturday morning is why God hates divorce. And then divorce is covenant breaking. And then usually you just get talked to, but then there's a chance for you to be able to talk back to ask questions, to say, well, what about this? What about that? And so there's a time to be able to do that as well with this. And so I think that's going to be an important time for you to be able to understand what it's about. You probably know either yourself or someone in your family or a friend that you have who is dealing with this. And so we need to have some good answers about this. Now, unfortunately, last time I made a really bad statement. I said, we don't know what John's going to talk about. I didn't mean by that that I don't know what his position is. We never quite know what somebody's going to say, but that was just a really bad statement to say. And so he knows what he's talking about. I think it's a good time to be able to start a conversation with that. So... um, Please just say, sometimes I mess up, and I don't even know what I'm saying part of the time. Maybe that's the best way to look at it. And then on Sunday morning, Jesus teaching on marriage and why marriages fail. We are doing all this to be able to understand how to deal with the negative side, what it is that God says to us. But our real goal is to promote marriages here, to promote family here, to be able to make this something that works in some place where we know that we can be with God and we can understand what God's really all about. And so that's, that's coming up in just a couple of weeks. So you're going to watch fireworks. Independence Day's coming. Tuesday's not that far off. Uh, American independence is always a great thing. July 4th, we declare ourselves to be independent. What does that mean? Well, does it mean that we're free? Yes. And we fight for that freedom. We think that is something extremely, extremely important. But we declare our independence together. I want you to make sure that you understand that we are united in our independence. It is the united states of all of us that are becoming independent. And I think independence today gets used in a whole different way. And that way is, I want my own independence. 
and I want independence from you, and I want independence from what anybody might think, and I want independence from, from anybody who would tell me what to do. Independence is never about individual independence. As soon as that happens, you've destroyed it. Independence is always about what we do as a group. And so it's never a matter of, well, I want my own independence. It's not a bunch of individuals who don't want anything to do with each other. It is a uniting together in this kind of independence. It's not just independence for me so that I can be selfish. That's not the kind of independence that we have as a nation, and certainly not the kind of independence that we find with God. One of the things that the passages talk about today in Exodus that uh, Elijah read to us. I think this is a very interesting time, and if there's ever a time for independence, maybe going back to that makes us realize what that's all about. Israel did not intend to be slaves. They had gone to the promised land. Abraham had has his sons. Everybody's there. And then there's a famine. Well, Joseph had gotten sold into Egypt, and so somehow God saw that this is the way that it works. And he sends all of the family of Abraham and Joseph and all of his family down into Egypt, and then gradually, over a period of time, they become slaves. And so they end up working for the Egyptians, and then it gets harder and harder and harder, and they become slaves and in need of independence. They developed as a whole nation. There's a huge number of people at this time. But how do you deliver a whole nation? Well, God decides it's time, mainly because the people cried out to him. And the people had said... We're tired of this slavery. Please deliver us from this slavery. We do not want to be part of this anymore. And so they called on God that God might deliver them. The passage we've read today is after God has told Moses to go back and bring his people out of Egypt. And as he goes back to bring his people out of Egypt, he goes back to Pharaoh and he says, I want you to let my people go. We're all going to go out to the wilderness and we're going to worship. Well, Pharaoh says, no, you're not going to do that. And the passage that's been read is God's declaration of Israel's independence. God's response is, then I'll show you who I am. I gave you one chance. You could let the people go. Of course, letting two million of the workforce go is not going to be an easy thing. I mean, it's going to have severe financial impact and everything else. But that's what he was asking to do. This passage is God's response to what Pharaoh has said. God says, I'm going to show you the strength by which I will bring my people out. I am declaring my people's independence today. I will bring them out with a strong hand. I will drive them out of the land. And so he talks here about the way in which all of this happens. He says, I am the Lord. I am the one who's going to bring them out. I established a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm going to keep that covenant to bring them back to this promised land, back to this place where we are able to all be together. And as you look at what he's talking about, he says, I'm giving them the land of Canaan. They're going to have their own land. I'm bringing them out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I'm going to deliver them from slavery. I will redeem you with the arm of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God you will know that it's me that brought you out. And so he is talking about here is the way in which I'm going to do this. And I've made this promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So he talks about this freedom, this slavery, this way in which he is going to bring them out. Of course, for God, it's easy to be able to say that. He can do anything. He's going to win every fight. You don't want to be on the other side of fighting against God. And so here we have God as the one saying, I'm going to bring my people out of slavery. Well, Egypt should have just said, okay, we give up. 
Instead, they don't. They say, no, you're not. We're going to keep them. And then you get plagues of blood and lice and flies and frogs and all kinds of other creepy crawly critters. And uh, until they finally decide, okay, we're going to let the people go. But there's another part to this story that I think we have to understand. It's very bold of God to be able to make this declaration of Israel's independence. But look at the next verse. It says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of the land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people out of the land of Egypt. And so while God is very determined and God is going to make this happen and God is the one who is going to see that their deliverance is now, their independence is now, their freedom is now, they don't believe in it. How can that be possible? How can you have people who don't really believe in this this blessing, this freedom, this God who says, I'm going to deliver you? And then they say, well, okay. It didn't really give them any confidence, did it? And I think we have to understand this about people sometimes. He says the people couldn't listen because of their harsh treatment, because of their broken spirit, because of all the things that had happened to them. And sometimes it's not so simple as just trying to solve the problem and saying, all right, we'll make this great. You're going to have great blessing. And it doesn't make the people believe it where they could even live it. Why not? Because sometimes when you've been hit so many times... You just don't get up anymore. And Israel has come to that point where they don't really believe anymore. They have been in slavery for 400 years and they're just, it's not going to happen. And what makes it worse is that Moses is convinced he's okay, he's seen God, he's talked to God, but as he goes, he's not really able to believe in it either. Why? Because there's nobody following you. It's real hard to be a leader when there's nobody following you. But he has a command of the Lord. He has all of this great blessing. He has all the power and strength of a mighty God who has declared at this point in history, I am going to bring my people out of Egypt. And he has no one following Because they can't hear, they can't believe, they can't quite understand that, yes, God is going to do this. And you need this kind of confidence. You need somebody who believes in you. All the good leadership in the world will not fix the lack of faith in the people. And you're probably familiar with the story. And what happens is Moses, with his great leadership, does bring the people out and yet... They are not a people of faith. They are not a people who really believes in the blessing of God. They are not a people who really sees or understands that God is so great of a power in their life that now they are able to stand against anything, that that God has made them a, a chosen people, and now they are able to have this great God. And they just don't believe it. But Moses believes in God because God's right there with him. And he tells the people to believe and with all the great miracles and everything that they're about to see, it still does not change the basic thinking that they have. So what keeps us down? 
you can talk to someone and tell them how great God is and how wonderful God is and how much of a blessing it is, and they say, does it mean I have to go to church? Did you, did you not get the first part of this? About how great God makes you and about how wonderful this God is who forgives and redeems and blesses, and you're like, yeah, but does it mean... I'm not sure we really quite understand. It's not always the situation or the circumstance that keeps us down. It's how we feel about the situation or the circumstance that can keep us down. Have you ever been around somebody who has all the negative self-talk? It's so much fun, isn't it, to be around people like that? (laughs) Because as soon as they start, something starts going wrong, they go, oh, you're so stupid. I don't know why you would do such a thing as that. You never do anything right. You're always doing this wrong. It's always terrible. It's always wrong. It's always... And they just kind of go off on their own conversation with themselves about how terrible of a person they are. Why would they do that? And the trouble is, I think they believe it. And they can't get past the fact that they're really not. Where did they ever develop that kind of idea? Where did it ever come to them that that they're worthless? And yet... I think we live in a world where a lot of people feel like it's all their fault and they're worthless. Other people start with the negativity and so we start with it too. Might as well agree with them. You're stupid. Yeah, I am. It doesn't really help. We never believe that we can do anything good. It isn't perfect. That's one of the worst things you can ever have is the idea that you have to do something perfect. God doesn't make perfect. He doesn't want perfect. He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to find our strength in him. And so we develop the wrong standard. We need to be around positive people. People who are forgiving. People who don't have to be perfect, but people who are able to find the blessing of God. And so how do you break someone's spirit? I think you give them too much to handle. Too much blame, perhaps. Where they can't see anything good. Where all the words they hear are bad. Where they can't believe in themselves. Where they can't even imagine it for themselves. There's a harshness that changes a person. So he's not able to believe anymore. When you've been screamed at all your life, you won't think you can do anything right. Too much harsh treatment makes us think we'll never do anything right. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit, according to Psalm 34, 18. That's our task. That's where we are. And it's not as simple as just going in and saying, oh, the Lord forgives you, the Lord redeems you, be happy. Because sometimes we have to deal with all the negative talk and all the negative things that have gone on in a person's life. God is, wants to bring Israel out in faith. Believe in the Lord and all this will work. And they're like, right. I think sometimes we need remedial blessing. We've been blessed, right? Right? But we don't really know that. We're not really sure about that. How are we blessed again? We tend to go back where we're comfortable. Sometimes back where we're comfortable is where I don't get crushed, where I don't get hit, where no one criticizes, and so I'll just crawl into the hole, crawl back in my comfortable cage where nobody pushes back anymore, and I'll just stay in the corner. That isn't what God came to bring. That's not independence. That's not God's blessing. Sometimes people have been crushed so much that it's hard for them to find their way out. So what makes the difference? How can we be a people who rises above such things? I think first you model faith for them. 
I think that's what Moses does is the best he can do. You model faith for them. You talk about what a, a powerful God we have. You let them see God in their situation. You let them. It's why we come to worship, really. I mean, it's, it's about being able to think of a powerful God and realize we worship a powerful God because that's what we do here. And we realize that that's real. Since the people could, didn't see Moses right, He's not able to be confident before Pharaoh. You realize that within two years, they were sitting at the edge of Canaan, and they could have gone in, and the whole ordeal could have been done because God has that much power to walk them in, to bring them out of Egypt, to bring them across a desert, to have given them a law, and now to lead them into a promised land. And it's a special land. It's always referred to as the land flowing with milk and honey. It's the best place you'd ever want to live. And God could give it to you. But instead, because of that, the people come out and they question Moses and they question God and they're never happy and they're never satisfied and they never quite understand and they grumble about the food and they gripe about the water and they don't think things are right and why is this and why is that and so they seem to always be arguing with somebody about something and they've never come to realize the understanding and the blessing that God has and when they get to the promised land they look and say Wow, that's a great land, what, what great crops it has. No, they say how big those people are. I don't think we can do this. And they go back to the wilderness and they wander for 40 years until every single one of them dies. Do you realize how tragic it is to have people in the blessing of God who cannot realize the blessing. They cannot declare their own independence. We are people of God. We are people who stand strong. We are people that God has blessed. And we cannot let others keep us down. We cannot let others make us think that that we are not God's people or that we have no power. What an incredible thing it is to realize what God is able to do. And let me urge you today, if you're one of the people dealing with all of this stuff from past or maybe from what you're going through now, don't let other people make you not understand what God gives you. This declaration of independence, what do you want to be independent from? Parents? Absolutely. I want to be independent from my parents. We can be independent from English rule. Yes, we can do that today. They don't have a chance. Can we be independent from slavery? Eh, most of us can. I mean, some of us are going to put ourselves back there. Can we be independent from debt? Well, no, now you're just meddling with things. <laughs> But wouldn't it be great to have that? Couldn't we have some kind of financial independence where we decide God provides for us and no one else has to pay anything for us and that's something that we would declare is our financial independence that we can stand on our own so that we're able to help other people. Maybe we need to be able to do that. To find our independence on a lot of different levels. I think we struggle with this concept It's like the prodigal son being invited back to the party. Would you feel apprehensive if you went in? You'd just blown all the dad's money and all your inheritance, and now you have nothing left. And he says, we're throwing a party. I want you to come. Would you feel bad? Well, of course not. Because the father has forgiven. It isn't what you did. It isn't because we're so great. It's because we believe in what the Father has said. We believe the Father has forgiven. And we understand that about ourselves, and so we're able to go in and able to rejoice. But you're still expecting the older brother, right? He's the guy who comes in and says, yeah, we know you. You're the guy. 
you're the guy who blew it all, you wasted it all, you're terrible, you're awful, and besides that, you're stupid and ugly. And we just have to say, God doesn't think so. He invited me into his party, and it is his place to make me what he wants me to be. And what he makes us to be is glorious. And that's what I want you to be able to realize today. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, one of the best passages that talks about what Jesus has done for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. What does it feel like to be so blessed? Isn't that great? Every spiritual blessing is in Christ, and Jesus came to be able to give that freely to us so that we could be holy, so that we could be blameless, so that we can be people of God. We've been adopted as children into his family. He says that's one of the most beautiful things. We are to the praise of his glorious grace. Because we're good? No, we know better than that. But you believe something better about yourself than what you know about yourself. Because you know your own limitations. And you believe in what God makes of you. Moses never believed he could lead Israel. Moses did a great job leading Israel. Because he just surrendered to God. And whatever God said, that's what he did. And so it isn't that he believes in himself. And it's not a matter of us being able to do that. But we believe in what God does. He says we have redemption in his blood. The forgiveness of our sins. The riches of his grace have been lavished. I like lavished. I don't know how you get lavished. But that's all. that just word just seems like there's a lot of it. When grace is lavished, it seems like that, you know, it's more than just a little bit that says, you know, okay, I sinned once and now I'm forgiven. Lavish grace seems like it's going to cover a whole lot of things with that. You can't read this passage and believe you're a failure. I mean, there's just no way. Look at what all is done. God has done. That you would be found not guilty, that you would be found redeemed, that you would be found blessed. This is all the promises and blessings of God, and people see it as, well, God did this for everybody. He did it for all those other people. And maybe he won't mind if I sneak in the door and tag along. That's never his intention. His intention is always that you would be part of it right in the middle. I think we have problems with brokenness. We have difficulty with broken spirit because the world has made slaves. I don't mean just physical ones. I mean it's more of emotional ones. You find the criticalness and the harshness of judgment that is pronounced on people and they become slaves trying to help, trying to be better, trying to live up to what somebody else wants. I want you to believe in God today. I want you to believe in what God gives. That if you've repented of your sins and been baptized into Christ Jesus, that this is yours. There is no doubt about it. He gives you a specific start time. My covenant started the day you went under the water. And there is a method of contacting the blood of Christ. And it goes on forever. 
I will not leave you. And he says he will always be there. If there's ever anybody who had a question about this, it would be Paul. And as Paul writes to Timothy, Paul wrote the Ephesian passage as well, but as Paul writes to Timothy about himself, he says this, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful in appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I received mercy for this reason, that in me was the foremost. Jesus Christ might display the perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. If anybody ever should have feel bad about going to church, it might have been Paul. In fact, some churches didn't allow him in at first. But Paul writes to Timothy about his acceptance in Christ, about what it made him able to do in Christ, about how it made him able to go in Christ, about how he knew what he was and he knows what he is now. And he says, therefore, I understand Jesus has given me greater opportunity. And he says, I have a better place to be able to serve. And that's really what it's all about for us as well. Jesus came to save sinners. And maybe the most negative, critical person say, and I am the biggest one. That's what Paul says. There's nobody bigger than me. I killed Christians. Nobody's done murder for Christ. Murder against Christ. But if you can forgive me, I can show you glory. And I am the example of what all God has come to do. Paul is such an example to all of us. It's one of the most amazing things. The display of that perfect patience in Paul... And all of the suffering that he does is to show Jesus has forgiven him and Jesus has made him useful. One of the greatest things that we get to see around here, you saw it when the kids came up, put their money in the basket or bucket up here, is a lot of little kids. And one of the greatest things I think about little kids is when you watch them run off and they're going exploring and they're, of course, right behind is a mom or a dad going, where are they going? What's going on now? But they have absolutely no fear. They're just going. And they might run into people, they might run into things, but they're just going to go around and keep going as much as they can. They own the world. Just look at them. They can crawl down the bench. They can do anything they want to do. And they are just off and going. Boy, if we could only have that kind of spirit again, couldn't we? That says something great. It says something great about a parent who has a child that has that much freedom to not worry about anything in this world at all whatsoever. Of course, they're going to correct. They're going to take them. They're going to make sure they're okay. But that's what they've got is that kind of freedom because somebody's watching. Somebody's taking care of me. Somebody's able to do this for me. We have that in God. We don't need to be afraid of anything. We need to realize God faces all situations. God faces all problems. God is able to give us that independence that we want, that we need. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin. But God sent his son to be broken that we might be healed. 
And yes, independence is about being free. And the greatest freedom, I think, is freedom from guilt and shame and sin. Free to make your own decisions. Free to change your own destiny. Free to have all the blessings and promises of a great God who's able to do that. The early people in this country came because they wanted religious freedom. It was a chance to worship God as they believed. And today we've turned it into the freedom to destroy ourselves in every possible way that we can. Let me encourage you to make a declaration of independence in your life. That you are going to declare yourselves free to live the most blessed life ever. Because God is able to fund a life like that. God is able to make us great. God is able to bless. And no matter what has happened in your past or what you're dealing with now, God forgives, God redeems, God blesses, and God makes us great. And I think that's what we share together as a community of people who have this kind of independence. This morning, if you don't have that, it's time you did. Please come talk to one of us. Let's stand and sing.